Welcome everyone. Uh, we are uh, starting part four of season four of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. I'm Sung Hun Lee from International Christian University. Uh, the co-host of the event is uh, Shigeto Kawahara from KU University. Today we have two exciting talks by Jonah Katz and Rebecca Starr. Uh, Shigeto uh, will introduce the first speaker. Go ahead. Okay, hey, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jonah. Um, Jonah and I have a lot in common, actually. So if you try to come up with a feature matrix for phonologists, um, Jonah and I form a natural class. So just to give you a few feature specifications that we share in common, Jonah and I have a co-authored paper with John Kingston, who is entering the room right now. Um, and we also have a co-authored paper with Lisa Selkirk, and we don't have a co with either McCarthy or Joe Pater. Um, and we are probably the only linguist who wrote a analysis of rap lyrics, a linguistic analysis of rap lyrics. So it's really my pleasure to have Jonah for this series, who's speaking about Cambodian Sardinian Lenition. Go ahead, Jonah. Thank you so much, uh, Shigeto. It's, it's an honor to be here. I'm really excited. Um, let me share my screen and then I'll tell you about, oh, this will stop others screen sharing. I'm gonna continue if that's okay. It's okay. Okay, I'm gonna start with my video on, um, but if my uh, connection starts getting funny, I'll probably turn the video off. Um, so let me know in the chat if my audio is starting to sound not great, um, and I'll turn my, my video off and hopefully that will help. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be telling you about uh, Lenitian and Fortitian patterns in Campidanese uh, Sardinian. Um, these have been described in the phonological literature as saltatory. I'll explain that a, a little bit later. Uh, um, and the, the patterns have been, uh, I think, oriented uh, phonology. Um, so so as uh, oh. uh, maybe you can uh, stop the video and uh, okay, the let me stop my video. So I just got the message. My uh, connection is stable. Hopefully it's going to get better now. Okay. Um, how am I? Uh, everybody hear me now? Yeah, yeah. better. Yeah, better. Okay. Okay. So as a first step towards trying to make some progress on these problematic patterns, uh, I'm going to offer a, a more complete description uh, of what's actually happening in the Lenition system. And so in particular, we'll see that these Lenition Fortition patterns are both phonetically and prosodically great, uh, that they affect all the sounds in the language, not just uh, a subset of consonants, um, and that they're uh, predictable from changes in duration. Um, so in order to capture these core properties of these sound patterns, I'm going to describe a new approach today where uh, the phonology is not doing anything with lenition or fortition. It's just uh, deriving abstract patterns of phonological contrast. And uh, the lenition and fortition patterns are going to come out of the prosodic component of the grammar acting on the output of those phonological computations. And I'm hoping this will help us solve some outstanding problems in trying to describe uh, this particular linguistic system, although I think there's also pretty clear um, implications for, for intervocalic lenition processes in other languages. Um, so having said that, let me start in. Uh, Campinanese Sardinian is the variety spoken uh, in most of the southern half of the island. Um, and my particular speakers that I'll be telling you about today come from roughly the area where this ellipse is uh, northwest of the capital city, Cagliari. Um, and this group of speakers, uh, there's certainly some variation, especially with uh, regard to uh, what kinds of lexical items they have. There's a little bit of phonological variation, but phonetically, it's actually a fairly homogeneous sample. Um, and here's the basic description of how uh, Lenition works in Campidanese. Um, I'll be taking exception to, to some of the aspects of this description later, but it's a good point. Um, and it's Roberto Bolognese's 
uh, English language description of the, of the phonology of Campidanese from his dissertation that's been picked up by a lot of uh, other phonologists working in English in the years since. Um, and it, it's sort of the basic starting point of, of what Campidanese lenition is like. Um, so we have uh, three different series of obstruents in, in absolute initial or utterance initial position. Uh, there's a set of voiceless stops, as in the verb uh, pi, uh, which actually means uh, take. I've, I've glossed it as drink here, but it's a more general verb. Um, you have, contrasting with that, a voiced stop series, uh, as in the verb bendi, to sell. Um, and then you have a voiceless fricative series, as in the word uh, filu, which means son. Um, and so these are the three contrasting series of obstruents in absolute initial position. Outside of absolute initial position, if you put one of these words after a vowel internal to the sentence, um, you get lenition. So the voiceless stop series uh, becomes voiced continuance. Uh, you take that same verb, pi, to take, um, and you put it after the first person auxiliary uh, that ends in a vowel here, uh, apu, so it's intervocalic, you end up with some sort of a voice continuant as in apu biao. I did that wrong. Apu biao. <laughs> so I have drunk or I have drank. Um, I don't actually know what the right English form is for that, but whatever. Um, and the voiceless fricatives uh, in the same context, voice, right? So you take the word lu, which means sun, you put the definite determiner before it so that it's in between vowels, you get suvilu, the sun. Interestingly, uh, at least in the Bolognese description, this lenition process doesn't affect the voice series. So you take a verb like bendi, which begins in a voice stop, uh, you put it after an object clitic uh, in between two vowels within a phonological phrase, um, and allegedly it just stays a voice stop. So you get rubendi uh, to sell it. Right? Um, and same thing here for the coronal stop underneath. Um, so this is the basic pattern. And it's hard to describe in most phonological theories. Uh, the reason is that the voiceless stop series, which I'll abbreviate here with a capital letter T, uh, undergoes a relatively radical change, change voicing and its continuancy, while the voice stop series fails to undergo just a subset of those changes. Uh, you can think about this as a kind of phonological derived environment effect. Uh, depending on your framework. And it's also been referred to as a saltatory pattern. So notably by Bruce Hayes and, and Jamie White uh, in their phonology paper. Um, you'll occasionally see this in a capscription uh, described as a chain shift, but that, that's erroneous. It's not a chain shift. Um, so here's what's going on. Um, I've arrayed some consonants here from the sort of most fortis, most consonantal voiceless stops up here, uh, down through more and more lenous consonants. Uh, down to the, uh, uh, the sonorants down here. Um, and the idea would be that these changes are taking a relatively fortis consonant, uh, like a voiceless stop, um, and changing it fairly radically right, in the output in a way that jumps over the voice stop, which doesn't change at all in this Linus context. And this is the basis for describing the alternation as saltatory. That's what that means. Um, I will spare you all the gory details of the many uh, formal innovations that have been introduced to account for this pattern, um, but it, it's quite problematic, uh, especially in constraint-based phonology, um, and it requires some sort of significant formal extension um, to the, the general uh, constraint-based theory of phonology in order to capture this pattern. So it's it's been a problem. Um, in order to try to sort of fix or remedy this problem, I'm going to start uh, by, by trying to give you a slightly complete description of what's going on here uh, based on my field work. So in particular, those voice stops, which are said to sort of stay the same no matter where they are in prosodic structure, um, my data shows that they actually do lenite sometimes. They approximantize. Um, and they don't do so as often or as radically uh, as the voiceless stop series, but they do sometimes lenite. Uh, so do all the other sounds in the language, right? So all the obstruents uh, show some sort of lenition. The sonorants show some sort of lenition. Vowel to vowel transitions actually show some sort of lenition. If we extend our vision of what lenition is to encompass uh, 
small non-contrastive changes in duration and in um, <clears throat> All of these changes in manner features and in intensity, intensity dynamics and slopes that are associated with these lenitian fortition patterns are mostly predictable from changes in duration. And um, these are generalizations that are based on uh, a paper I, I uh, published in laboratory phenology a couple of years ago. Um, it's these basic descriptive generalizations, and I'll be going into more detail about these today. Uh, here's what I'm going to propose today. Uh, the way to make sense of Compidonese lenition patterns is to recognize that they're not happening in the G. Um, instead, they're the consequence of prosodic lengthening and shortening conditioned by prosodic domain boundaries. Uh, and and these processes operate on the output of phonology. They're not manipulating phonological features. Um, so we can think of this as a language specific phonetic grammar, the model I'll give you today. Um, that's not the only way to think about it, but it's probably the most straightforward way to conceive of what uh, I'm gonna propose is as a language specific phonetic grammar. So in this uh, model of, of Compidonese, uh, Lenition, what's happening in the phonology? Not much. You get computation of phonological contrast using features or elements or whatever your favorite phonological theory is. This can be in uh, optimality theory, it can be in rules, whatever phonological framework you want. We just need basic patterns of segmental contrast in the output with no Lenition or Fortition in that phono phonological output. So, really boring phonology here. Uh, we have these words in absolute initial position. We have a contrasting series of voiceless stops, voice stops, voiceless fricatives, no underlying voice fricatives, and then some sonorants and whatever other consonants there are. are uh, you put these after a vowel within a phonological phrase. Sorry, that's a helicopter passing over my house. <laughs> uh, you put these same consonants after a vowel within a phonological phrase, and nothing happens in the phonology. Exact same phonological outputs. There's no phonological action going on here. Um, the interesting things start uh, when you start to implement these phonological outputs uh, into prosodic phrases. And so in order to do this, I'm going to need some way of talking about prosodic phrasing. Um, it's a little bit tricky because there's no sort of independent criteria in Compidonese for singling out oh, there's an intonational phrase and there's a major phonological phrase. Um, and so what I'm gonna do here is define potentially prosodic phrase initial positions in terms of their syntactic properties alone. Um, then measure sounds in those syntactically prominent positions, compare them to other sounds that are word initial, but not in those syntactically defined phrase initial positions um, and try to uh, see if we can get some, some mileage out, out of uh, looking at the prosodic structure in this way. Um, so here's what I've defined syntactically as potentially phrase initial positions. And this done uh, the, the few existing papers that have looked at prosody at all in, in the language. Um, and so I've picked out these uh, large syntactic units, uh, a verbal argument or adjunct, um, a full clause, uh, embedded clause, that is, um, and a matrix predicate following a non- Pronominal object um, as being potentially phrase initial positions. So you take some uh, longer sentences here, um, and based on their syntactic structure, I would break them up into the following potential prosodic phrases where the red sounds here, consonants and vowels, are considered potentially phrase initial. The blue ones are going to be considered word initial, but not phrase initial. So this particular sentence is. Uh, the kid has left the floor dirty from grass, uh, and it would come out something like uh, This one uh, similarly um, is going to be broken up into a number of smaller phonological phrases on the basis of the syntax. Um, that boy uh, wanted to sell me a boar. Uh, um, and that is, uh, again, we're going to be comparing these sounds in red here, which are potentially phrase initial, to the ones in blue that are medial. This is the basic approach to prosody. Uh, my data come from field recordings of 15 speakers in the Campidano. 
Um, and these are the same recordings I reported on in my, my laboratory phonology paper a few years ago, but I've redone the acoustic analyses in um, a, a more appropriate way for the modeling that I'm doing right now. Uh, this comes from a translation task from Italian. Uh, there's no standard orthographic written form of Sardinian. Um, so we designed this Italian translation task to try to elicit a variety of consonants in different prosodic positions at the beginning, um, successively larger prosodic domains. Um, and all of the duration and intensity measurements were done in a, a semi-automated semi way uh, using extrema in the slope of intensity contours, um, smooth intensity contours over bandpassed audio files. Um, and this is based on John Kingston's approach to measuring uh, lenition and, and uh, lenition related duration. So this is basically uh, taking uh, John Kingston's method. So here's a, a rough qualitative description of what's going on. Um, and as most previous accounts uh, say, in utterance initial position, these three series of consonants are usually realized as voiceless stops, as voice stops, and as voiceless fricatives. That's generally how they show up um, in initial position. If you put them internal to an utterance uh, in this uh, potentially phrase initial positions, you find that the voiceless stops, about 80% of them become approximants. Uh, and if you move into the phrase medial position, that goes up to 95%. So there's scalar effects of prosody here on degree and uh, the, the uh, frequency of lenition. Um, these voice stops, which are said not to change uh, in, in phrase medial positions, um, what I find is that in the phrase initial positions, they are mostly voice stops, but there's a significant minority of these segments that are realized as approximants as well. And when you get into phrase medial position, it's about 50 50 uh, stops and approximants. <coughs> Excuse me. The fricative series are mostly voiceless fricatives in absolute initial position. Uh, Utterance medially in phrase initial position, they go to about 65% fully voiced. Um, and then phrase medially, that goes up to 80%. So we're seeing these scalar prosodic effects on lenition of the obstruents. Um, and interestingly, uh, this also holds for other kinds of segments in the language, right? So uh, sonorants like nasals and li liquids don't you know, usually have stops or they're not usually voiceless. But if you measure their intensity, what you'll find is that in the phrase initial position, they tend to be more consonantal, less intense uh, and longer. Well, in the phrase medial positions, they tend to be more intense, uh, less consonantal and shorter. Um, and this clearly has uh, parallels to what's going on with the obstruents up here. And actually, if you look at the transition between two vowels, you find something in phonetic term uh, that two vowels flanking a prosodic phrase boundary um, tend to have longer and larger drops in intensity in between them. If you look internal to a phrase, uh, where those drops in intensity occur, and they don't always occur, but when they do, they tend to be shorter and shorter drops in intensity internal to a phrase. So we have these sort of qualitative uh, lenition patterns going on for the obstruents um, that are also mirrored uh, with quantitative patterns having to do with intensity. And what we're seeing is that um, we're finding also smaller non-contrastive differences based on prosodic position in all other consonants as well, and even vowel to vowel transition. So this is quite systematic, uh, the, these, these patterns of prosodically conditioned strengthening and weakening. Um, here's what my phonetic grammar is gonna do with this. We take the output of the phenomenon, um, whether it's stated in terms of your standard distinctive features or whatever you prefer. Here I've given um, presentations for the voiceless consonants with uh, unspecified voicing. That's not cr crucial. It's something I, that seems sensible to me. Um, it, it doesn't matter too much what the representations are here, as long as they're minimally contrastive with one another. So each of these phonological outputs is gonna be associated with an inherent duration. Interestingly, the putative voiceless stop series here needs to be associated with a shorter duration than other obstruents. And I think that calls into question 
whether we really want to think of this as a voiceless stop at all, but I'll leave that for now. Um, we can come back to that later. Um, so each uh, class or each manner of consonant is going to have some inherent duration target. Um, and then that's going to get fed through prosodic structure. So here I'm showing you two words that begin with this phonological segment. It's a voiceless dorsal stop um, in the phrase that dog, kusu, kain. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, this k in the determiner is phrase initial, while the k in the noun is not. Um, and so we're going to get a phrasal duration boost for this first voiceless stop, uh, while the second one uh, gets a smaller boost. And I've given it a word initial prosodic boost in duration here. In my data, there's actually little evidence that, that words uh, even matter for duration boost, but I wanted to just illustrate how the system works. Um, in any case, the phrase initial one is now going to be longer than the phrase medial one. Other than that, they're phonologically identical. Um, and then those representations, which are phonologically identical but differ in their duration, will be fit into the phonetic implementation component. Um, and I'm going to remain agnostic today about whether uh, that phonetic implementation has primarily gestural targets or primarily auditory targets or whether there's some mix of both. Um, it, you know, I have my own views on this, but it's not crucial for the theory here. There's going to be some kind of goals or targets for these segments. Uh, they're going to differ in the amount of time they have accomplish these goals or reach these targets. And the result is going to be differences in the surface duration and manner of these phonologically identical objects, depending on where they are in prosodic structure. Um, and that's uh, the only thing driving fortition and munition in this theory. Um, so here's a, a slightly more elaborate example. Um, this is a contrived sentence. It might not even be grammatical, but the idea here is that I'm giving you three phrases with one of each series of obstruent in phrase initial and phrase medial position, phrase initial, phrase medial, phrase initial, phrase medial. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with a theory that boosts the duration of phrase initial sounds um, the same, no matter what kind of sound it is. Um, and it's going to be the same in logarithmic duration space, not in milliseconds. But this is the basic idea. These phrasal effects on duration are quite general. They don't just apply to some phonological objects. So I'm going to use an equal duration boost for each kind of segment when it's in one of these phrase initial positions. Um, and here's how that modeling uh, runs out here. So what we're looking at here uh, is histograms of the duration for voiceless stops on the left here, voice stops in the middle, and voiceless fricatives on the right here in phrase medial positions up top and phrase initial positions down below. And the bars in these histograms uh, are the actual data that I have from my corpus, while the density curves are showing you one particular simulation um, of the data uh, based on my model, which is drawing the durations of these different segments um, from a, a normal distribution in logarithmic duration space. Um, and that's also been uh, relativized with, with a z-score in order to abstract away from between uh, speaker differences. Um, and so uh, the basic uh, thing that I'm trying to share is that this very simple model that just takes the duration of a segment in phrase medial position and gives it a little boost in phrase initial position, regardless of what kind of a segment it is, it doesn't do a terrible job at capturing duration patterns. We're getting the right rough relative patterns here. Next step, you take those simulated durations uh, and you feed them into the phonetic implementation component. Here, I'm interested in modeling properties like whether a segment is voiced all the way through its closure, whether it has an audible or visible burst. Um, and each of these is going to be expressed as a probability that depends on the manner of articulation, the natural class of the segment, and its duration, right? So, uh, you know, a voiceless stop and a voice stop are going to differ in their temporal dynamics. Um, but the claim is that the, for, uh, the fortis and the lenus voiceless stop are not going to differ in this function between duration and voicing in this case. They're only going to differ in their duration. Same thing 
for the probability of observing a burst for each of these sounds. Same thing for the minimum intensity that each of these sounds reaches. Uh, we're gonna cast each of these as a function of, of uh, duration of movement or its temporal separation from a preceding call. So here um, are some simulations of voicing up top here uh, and burst presence down bottom for again, the voiceless stops uh, on the left, the voice stops in the middle, voiceless fricatives on the right. Uh, for the bursts, obviously, I'm most stops fricative. And what you're seeing here is uh, the solid shapes are in phrase initial position, the dashed shapes are in uh, phrase medial position, and the vertical lines are the observed proportions in the corpus. In this case, the observed proportions of uh, word initial voiceless stops that are fully voiced um, in phrase initial and phrase medial positions. And these density curves are 10,000 simulations of my corpus based on these functions uh, that I've assigned to the durations in order to get phonetic properties. Um, and, and so if this were a perfect simulation, then every single vertical line would be directly in, in the middle, of every single corresponding density curve um, that's not what we find here. That would also be extremely suspicious uh, given the number of, si of simplifications I've made. But what we're here is basically the right relative patterns, right? The longer uh, that a voiceless stop gets, uh, the less likely it is to be fully voiced, the more light it is to have an audible burst and so on and so forth. Right? So that's what's going on here. We're getting basically the right relative patterns. Um, the sort of uh, conceptual reasoning behind this simulation, what are they doing? Well, the idea that the probability of reaching whatever target a segment has will increase with its temporal distance from the preceding vowel. Um, so for instance, if you're a stop, uh, reaching a full stop closure is gonna be easier if you have more time to get there from the preceding vowel. If you're uh, a, a plus voice segment, um, then the probability of your voicing gesture failing will also increase with the temporal distance from the preceding vowel uh, because you won't get that uh, help from, from passive or carryover voicing from that preceding vowel. If you're not specified as voiced, then the probability of passive voicing will decrease with your temporal distance from the preceding vowel. Right? This is the basic idea. The further you get from that preceding vowel, the less likely you are to be voiced, uh, the more likely you are to reach, say, a stop target. Um, and with just these stipulations, we can get all of the obstruent voicing and spiritization effects in the corpus. These can all be modeled using just these minimal assumptions. Uh, what about absolute initial positions? So far, I'm just showing the medial phrase initial and phrase medial positions. And it's hard to measure duration in utterance initial position. Uh, for voiceless stops, maybe it's impossible without articulatory data. But what we can do is reason about it qualitatively. Right? So for voicing, your temporal distance from the preceding vowel is essentially maximal, right? There is no preceding vowel. Um, so the probability of voicing a segment that's not phonologically specified for voicing should basically be zero. And that's, that's right. That's what we see. Uh, ability of voicing failure should be some baseline rate uh, for voiceless stops in this case, because uh, voicing and stopping are aerodynamically antagonistic to each other. Um, corpus, the baseline failure rate, utterance initial position is about 20%, right? Um, and so this all makes sense if you think about this as being temporal dynamics. For contingency, this is a little bit trickier um, what we have in utterance initial position is, again, there's no preceding vowel from which to transition. Um, so, you know, all else being equal, it should be easier to read your full closure target. Um, and indeed, in the corpus, we, you know, 80% of all the stuff realized with audible bursts in this position. Um, that said, I will say that there's still something kind of about these stops, the voiceless ones. Um, it just not very stoppy, even in utterance initial position. And I can talk about later in the question period, but basically they're most likely stops in this position, even if there's still something kind of funny about them. 
Um, time check. How am I doing here? Okay, so I'm about a half hour in. I think I have time to talk about uh, other segments. Let me do that. Um, so medial geminates, and you can create word initial geminates um, in some exceptional circumstances. So in particular, initial uh, stop, voiceless stops can geminate um, underlying clusters across word boundaries. Um, fricatives can do so as well. And then you also get a few exceptional underlying geminate fricatives word initially in these definite determiners, su and sa. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is that um, even though they don't lenite as much and they're really more fortis overall, even the geminates show these kinds of gradient scalar lenition phenomena. Um, so in particular, uh, voiceless stops show gradient voicing when they're phrase medial, um, and they're somewhat more likely uh, to be uh, released in a phrase initial addition. And even the geminate fricatives uh, gradiently show some voicing uh, phrase medially. Uh, and modeling this as variation in duration, uh, my model can handle this, right? So geminates are typically um, somewhat resistant to lenition effects. Uh, and in phonological theory, where that's of geminate inalterability, or you, uh, it's very hard to explain how geminates could also show gradient lenition. In this phonetic model, this falls naturally from their chin. Um, this is not limited to qualitative features, though, like voicing and the presence of audible bursts. If lenition and fortitudes are about the temporal distance between a domain final vowel and targets for the domain initial sound following it, then degrees of undershoot ought to be reflected in thick measurements for all sounds in the language, not just obstruents. And indeed, that's exactly fine. So here I'm modeling not the proportion of sounds that bear some categorical feature, uh, but the minimum intensity that different sounds reach during their closures. As you can see here for obstruents like this voiceless stop series, uh, you get lower minimum intensity, more consonantal realizations phrase initially in these dashed shapes than you do uh, phrase medially in these solid shapes. But the exact same thing is true for nasals and even for the transitions in between two vowels, as you can see here in this last panel. And my model, again, can handle this kind of uh, scalar variation that's based on differences in duration. Uh, one more thing. Yeah, a couple minutes left. I'll uh, talk about what makes these lenition patterns different from change and fall features. Um, so what we've seen so far uh, is that these kinds of lenition fortition patterns are really predictable from changes in the duration of different segments. Um, and I've claimed that therefore we model uh, uh, as prosodically driven changes to duration in the grammar and let the lenition and fortition fall out from those duration differences. Uh, rather than trying to model lenition and fortition directly as changes in phonological features or phonological structure or something like that. Um, but if you really like uh, this approach of using phonological features, you might say, well, maybe the differences between uh, different phonological sounds that are the input and output of lenition are also a consequence of duration differences. So we could still say that lenition and fortition are changing features and the duration is a consequence of that. Um, so uh, the, the last simulation here is just to show that this really doesn't work, right? Um, so this first uh, slide here is showing you what happens if you try to measure the prosodically boosted initial voiceless stops over here as being uh, having changed to be like geminates. So what if you try to use the geminate voicing function to put what happens to long singletons? The answer is uh, the observed value falls outside the range of all 10,000 simulations of the corpus. Similarly, for the presence of audible bursts, um, you can't just treat these things as slightly shorter minutes. It doesn't work that way. Um, and that's shown here as well for the voicing function for fricatives. The singleton fricatives here are not just acting like uh, slightly shorter uh, uh, geminates. That's not how this is here. 
So that was one idea. What if the phrase initial guys are being geminated? And that's based on phonological work. And the other question would be, what if they're just teachers like voice continuancy? And this also, in a phonetic sense, doesn't work, right? So here we're trying to apply uh, the uh, voicing function from a plus continuance segment like the fricative to these elongated, excuse me, or the lenited uh, voiceless stops here. Um, and what we see is that we can't predict enough voicing. They're not behaving like plus continuance segments that are just too short or something like that. It's not working that way. What if we try to model uh, those lenited voiceless stops as having been rendered plus voice energy, it still doesn't work, right? We can't get them to show few enough bursts if we model them as being basically like the voice stops. So uh, the uh, phonetic differences associated with lenition and fortition are predictable from duration uh, within manner in a way that differences between different phonological classes are not predictable from duration. This relatively salient lenition for obstruents is part of a continuum of prosodically conditioned duration and intensity changes that affect all sounds in the language. And all of these differences in the probability of voicing, of audible bursts, of intensity, intensity changes, intensity slopes uh, across prosodic positions, these are mostly predictable from differences in duration. So here's my, my executive summary. Uh, these Compidonese lenition fortition patterns are pretty hard to make sense of in phonological terms, um, but they make a lot more sense in phonetic terms. And they, if not reduce, they at least relate to quite general properties of prosodic phrasing, of temporal dynamics, uh, and of, of duration. Uh, to the extent that lenition patterns in other languages, in particular, these kinds of intervocalic voicing and spirantization patterns that you find in many languages, if they show the same kind of independence from and even in different phonological features, it would be worth asking whether those kinds of intervocalic lenition patterns might also be amenable to a phonetic analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have some question already. Uh, let's let's first say uh, thank you and send uh, Jonah some applause. <laughs> and yeah, so the first question uh, comes from uh, Manami Hirayama. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, the idea, I like the idea that those sort of seemingly segmental uh, processes may be uh, explained by the prosodic structure. And um, I was thinking uh, when you said, uh, so the prosodic phrasing uh, that you're kind of assuming here was strictly sort of coming from the syntax only. Um, and I think in one uh, slide, you had the, uh, the su subject, subject NP and uh, for the predicate BP, there are two uh, sort of, there, there is the prepositional uh, phrase and the verb and object. Um, I, I, I don't know about the syntax of Italian much, but um, I was thinking if you say so, and also I think in articulatory phonology or recursive uh, phonological phrasing framework, um, if there is sort of more boundaries uh, <laughs> at some edge, uh, the, the articulation or you know the whatever the phonetic effects get stronger uh, when because you know as you get a higher in the prosodic hierarchy you get more more stuff in there. So uh, for example, at the left edge of the predicate VP, um, the number of sort of brackets, uh, square brackets. Uh, I, I think I it was uh, some slides before um, when you had the. Uh, So it was a it was a, a predicate DP that you were interested in. Yeah, a slide twenty in your PDF, I think. Uh, this, so the numbers oh, are going to be out of alignment because okay, I put well, maybe uh, that, dimensions okay. in these. Uh, anyhow, so um, I, I think in neoprosodic prosodic phrasing, it sort of looks uh, the 
the phonological phrases uh, are kind of flatly structured. But I was wondering, um, let's say at the end, at the beginning of the predicate BP, there is sort of more phonetic effects than, um, yeah, there, sort of, yeah, uh, at the beginning of the uh, prepositional phrase, uh, phrasing or something like that. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely a possibility. I mean, great question, first of all, thank you. Um, but yeah, so I think I've, Jonah, you can uh, stop your video. I think we we couldn't. That's hear. right. Yeah, sorry. Um, I shouldn't have asked you to <laughs> bring up the slides. Is Jonah still there? Let's wait a little bit. <laughs> so. Uh. Ah. Is John unmuted? Because no, not unmuted. Yeah. Uh... Oh, <laughs> he got disconnected. Uh, for yeah, so let's wait a little bit. Uh, he will come back. Yeah. So. Uh... Yuki, can you briefly uh, pause the recording? Sorry about that. Do you remember the question? Okay. Uh, yes, I remember the question. Um, I think I did not get very the answer before I cut out. Um, let me um, put the slide back up again uh, quickly. Right, so here's my sort of toy prosodic structure. Um, and absolutely, um, I, I suspect that like every other language that's been studied, you know, that there's going to be a more articulated prosodic structure here. Um, so I think you asked specifically about the break between the, the subject, uh, that hunter here, and the predicate verb phrase here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably that would be a higher level prosodic boundary. Um, I, I don't have the amount of data, you know, in all these positions that I would need to really probe those gradient or scalar differences systematically. And so the, the approach I took um, was instead to try to get at least two levels, right? Something that is a big syntactic juncture versus something that isn't a big syntactic juncture and see if I could find reflexes of that. Um, and, but yeah, absolutely. I suspect that you would get more finely articulated scalar prosodic differences if you had the one true theory of Sardinian syntax phonology interface. I mean, this was very much inspired by the work you mentioned about um, initial strengthening um, in Korean, Taiwanese, French, Japanese, uh, with, you know, uh, Pat Keating and all of her colleagues. I, I don't see being different in principle from these kinds of lenition patterns are very much the same thing. Um, is that a, an answer to the question that you were asking? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's the data or, you know, that shows sort of this, that kind of uh, I, I think I think the most I have with this particular um, data is is um, two word initial uh, sentence medial positions and um, besides the you know the, the word medial and utterance initial so I've got um, definitely evidence for a difference between some kind of phrase initial versus word initial and I don't think I can go beyond that with the data that I have, but but I do suspect that such differences probably exist. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from uh, Taiki Hashimoto, uh, Joech University of Edu Education. Okay, so uh, thanks for the talk. Um, maybe I, it, it seems better to turn off my video. So I just turn off my video here. But I just want to say thanks for your talk. And oh, uh, I, have, I have two questions here. So the first one is about uh, word specific effects. So uh, as far as I understood, uh, your, re your research demonstrates that, uh, so the lenition is not categorical phenomenon, but it's optional. And I'm, I'm wondering whether all the words show the same probability of lenition. 
So uh, as, as in your acknowledgement, uh, Rio Cohen Priva demonstrates that so higher word frequency leads to more remission. And I'm wondering whether you observe this kind of phenomenon. Uh, and the second question is, the second question also relates to this question. So uh, if you observe some uh, word specific phonetic stuff, I'm wondering how your theoretical framework can incorporate uh, the frequency effects because it seems that the, your theoretical framework, so it's very robust, but by the way, but uh, the theoretical framework uh, seem to uh, predict that a phoneme uh, undergoes lenition at the same rate, regardless of a word. So I have these two questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Those are both really good questions. The, the answer to the first one is going to be disappointing uh, because the answer is, I, I don't know. Um, so, I mean, surely in, in the data, you know, if you observe uh, rates or quantities of different kinds of lenition, you will observe differences for different words, whether those are systematic or just sampling error. Um, I, I would need to design a different kind of task, a different kind of experiment to really answer that question in a meaningful way. Um, what, what I can say at um, the first sort of step here in just trying to describe the lenition system phonetically, um, I, I called word a random variable, right? And so I put in random intercepts and I maybe I tried random slopes for some of these effects and um for sure there are different between different words uh i i can't say anything systematic about that because i have the right kind of data to really investigate word specific differences but i fully expect that if you did have the right corpus that you would find um some sort of you know word specific effects of lenition as you're asking about i, I assume they exist uh the second question about how I'd incorporate that into the framework um, is, you know, right now I have absolutely nothing as you as you said about the, those kinds of word specific effects. Um, what this this is meant as a, a sort of bare bones model of how the prosodic aspects of lenition are being implemented. Um, and of course, you know, to get actual intensity predictions or actual uh you know phonetic measurement predictions there's going to be a huge variety of factors that i haven't put in the model here you're going to need to know about the speaker and the word and like the recording level and how excited the speaker is and how fast they're talking and things like that and the the idea is that this model is providing a sort of basic scaffolding um, upon which you could then superimpose every other kind of variation that's out there in the universe but I'm mostly just trying to deal with the prosodically conditioned variation here. And I, your point is well taken. I assume that the speaker and the word and the speech rate and everything else is also going to affect the probability of lenition. But yes, I, do, I don't have any of that in the model right now. Okay, so uh, thanks for the answer. Actually, it makes sense. So maybe frequency effects may be accounted for uh, using a different mechanism, I think. So yeah, so thanks for your answer. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, John Kingston from UMass Amherst, please. Hey, John. Hey, John. Enjoyed hey, John. your talk. Hi. Um, so real quick question. Um, you started out by telling us about how um, the relative frequency of different manner realizations depended on the position and the prosodic phrase. So you talked about you know, a certain percentage of stop realizations or proximate realizations and so on, which suggests mm -hmm. um, that there's still something to the a featural description of um, the realizations of these segments. And to extend this a little further, um, what you showed us in the modeling results um, was um, largely non-overlapping distributions uh, predicted by your model, um, which suggests also that some kind of quasi-categorical uh, uh, realization is still present here. Um, so it, it strikes me that, that the gradients, I, I'm not disputing the gradients that you, that you demonstrate so much as whether the distributions are sufficiently non-overlapping. We can still talk about categories of, of, of allophones in different contexts. 
Yeah, thank you, John. That's a, an, a, a good question. Um, I think, I mean, th there's definitely something to the uh, sort of original allophonic description that Bolognese gives. I, I don't want to claim that he's wrong. I don't think he's wrong. I think the description is incomplete. Um, what I can say is, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second here. <laughs> Family okay. things going on inside. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think um, part of what's going on here uh, is that there's there's variation all through the all through the system, right? So you know, I, I sort of came to the language expecting to find like we're going to get 100% stops here and 0% stops here. And that's not what I found. And there's still um, this issue of uh, basically the, the voiceless stops the night a lot more than the other segments. Um, and that's still in keeping with this sort of saltatory description. Uh, and then, I mean, I guess the, the other thing I would say about, about it, um, oh, I had an answer and now it's gone. <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, oh, right. Yeah, this was the other point. Um, so the other thing that's going on is that you can describe the presence or absence of voicing in this segment or the presence or absence of a burst in this segment as being a change in phonological features, but it's also not a minimally contrastive phonological feature in this language, right? So when... Um, you know, the voiceless fricative's voice, it's not neutralizing any contrasts. And when the voiceless stops lenite and the voice stops lenite, uh, they're producing overlapping phonetic distributions, but they're not categorically neutralizing. Um, and so this is tied to some of my earlier work where I um, was trying to case that these particular kinds of intervocalic lenition processes very, very rarely change phonological features that otherwise contrastive in a language. And that's actually the same in Kaneze. It's just that the particular phonetic patterns of what they're changing are a little bit more baffling than they are in, you know, Spanish or something like that. Um, but it has this same property of never producing full category neutralization. Um, and so for that reason, I, I think, I, I mean, what I was trying to do here actually was producing um, phonetic overlap between these distributions, because I think that's how these intervocalic clinician processes actually work. I think there often are overlapping distributions. And I was hoping that that would fall out of this particular modeling approach, because that seems to me to be um, the closest that these come to full neutralization is having this kind of phonetic overlap. Is that, does that make sense as an answer to your question? It does. Uh, thank you. Um, it's, I guess the question I would raise then in response would be, to what extent do they overlap? Um, as what, in terms of the mass of the distributions? Um, yeah. So empirically, I don't have those plots up here. I can tell you in, in the case of the voiceless and voice stops that both approximatize, um, the voice stops remain longer on average than the voiceless ones, but there's substantial phonetic overlap in those distributions, phrase media. Really. Um, what my what my model will get again, I don't have those plots up here, but there's definitely going to be some degree of overlap. These particular distributions in this slide that I'm sharing, uh, yeah, they're probably a little bit too sharp, a little bit too spiky, um, and that is something to think about. Yeah. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Uh, let's uh, thank him one more time and yeah, we will stop the recording now. Thank you all very much.